As I was preparing for this meeting, uh, I had a whole bunch of things that I was praying about and considering. And uh, I just really feel like God wants me to do an activation service today. We're going to activate you guys. We're going to have some impartation. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you. And you will see an increase in supernatural activity in your life. I say that with total faith and with audacity. Faith is audacious because faith looks in the void in the face of uh, faith looks in the face of opposition, and it says, "Not on my watch, not today." Faith makes a claim. How many of you know that faith without works is dead? Faith does something. Okay, James tells us that if you show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. That doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that we have to do works to see things happen. It means that we see things happen and do things because we have faith. Are you with me? Okay. So I'm making that claim today. God's going to activate you. You're going to see an increase today going forward, hopefully for the rest of your lives. He wants to bring you to a new level. I'm telling you, church, we've only scratched the surface of what God wants to do in this place, in this house, in this city in this nation, and in this world that we live in. We have only scratched the surface of something that is infinitely deep. When you go home, I want you to take a knife out of your cupboard, go to your kitchen table, and scratch it. And you'll see that when you scratch that finish on top, you remove maybe 128th of an inch of something that's there, a substance that's there. I'm telling you, we've removed 128th, one 128th of an inch of something that has no end. There is no end of God. He's infinite. We are finite. He's infinite. There is no end. I'm telling you, I am loaded for bear this morning. I've been shaking because I'm so excited to share some of the things that God wants me to share with you. I, was, I felt uh, when, when Heather and those guys were singing this morning to take a quick look at Ezekiel 37. I'm going to read some of this really quick. Ezekiel's there by the river Kibar in captivity, and this is what he says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. And caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered safely, oh wait, that's not in there. And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinew upon you, tendons, and I will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you, that word also means spirit. I will put spirit in you, and you shall live, and you shall know Say no. no. You shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld the sinew, the tendons, and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them, there was no spirit in them. They said unto me, then he said unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. God is taking Ezekiel out of his comfort zone. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but sometimes the Lord will take you to places and he'll show you things that seem crazy. It seems crazy to me that you would go to a valley that's full of dead men's bones, 
that have been bleached by the sun probably for years and years and possibly even decades upon decades. I see that the birds have picked the flesh clean, that there's nothing remaining of life. There's only bones that have begun to decay and begun to fall apart and begun to unravel and as the wind blows you see pieces of the of the bone becoming dust and blowing through the sky let me paint this picture for you and Ezekiel standing there and the Lord says can these bones live he didn't ask him can can bones that look pretty pretty clean you know maybe a dead body that's just been there for a few minutes can that one live he said can these bones live and Ezekiel takes route D and he says, you know. Can I tell you today that sometimes in our country, in America today, it looks like we're looking at a valley of dry bones. I look at Fox News or CNN or whatever else happens to be on as I'm walking through a store. <laughs> and I see all of the negativity and all of the stuff that's going on. And I see all of this stuff coming up with the 2020 campaign and, and all of the fear and the trepidation and all of the stuff that's happening in our nation that says these are dry bones. There's no hope. Dry bones. Dry bones. It's been decades since we've had a move of God that completely resurrected an army. It's been decades. The birds have picked the flesh clean of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Decades, year after year after year of declension and decline, and year after year after year after falling deeper and deeper and deeper into a dry place. There's no hope. There's no future. It's over. But I'm going to tell you something today, that God is calling for an army of supernatural people to come out of the midst of this nation. I'm speaking to you very prophetic today. He's calling for a people that have had no life. He's going to prophesy over this nation. He's calling you to prophesy over your job, over your family, over your home, over your past, over your future. He's calling you to stand over the valley of dry bones in your life and begin to prophesy to it. And say, dry bones, live. Thus says the Lord, you will live. You will have life. You will not go into decline anymore. You will not fall anymore. You will not see debauchery and declension any longer. You will have life. And I'm prophesying to this church today. If you people can't get excited right now, let me do it for you. Live. Dry bones, live. Life, live. Live. There's life. There's life in Christ. There's life in His Spirit. There's life in the Word of God. There's life in standing in faith. There's life in taking a chance. Live. Can I preach a minute? Thank you. That's not my text. Whew. Revelation 19.10 says, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant. And of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is my actual text. I'm going to activate you today. We're going to see an increase in supernatural power, supernatural activity. Many of you are going to begin to have dreams and visions. Many of you are going to begin to see sick people healed. Many of you are going to see the prophetic part of your lives come alive. It's going to, it's going to get better and better and better. There's no ifs, ands, or buts following that statement. Those of you that know me know that I don't really back down. So I'm telling you that. It's going to get better. You're going to see an increase. You're going to become activated. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. John is having a revelation of heaven. When people read the book of Revelation, oftentimes they say, wow, that book scares me. Don't be afraid. It's the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read the last two chapters. There's nothing to be afraid of. That's okay. Y'all catch up here in a minute. Y'all catch up here in just a minute. <clears throat> There's nothing to fear. And he sees a man in heaven. And John, this man is so radiant. Can I use that word in this church? 
This man is so radiant, he's so glorious, there's so much of God's awe and splendor and wonder on him that John, the Apostle John, the beloved, falls down and begins to worship him. And he says, stop this. I'm a man just like you. Worship God. I've been on a kick lately. My wife will tell you, for the last two or three weeks, I've been studying near-death experiences and people that have had out-of-body experiences and have seen heaven. Uh, some of them I've been studying where people have seen hell. And I've just become almost infatuated, almost obsessed with getting more of a glimpse of heaven. I've had two encounters where I've seen a piece of heaven. Nothing like some of the ones that I've seen and some of the ones that I've been listening to. I can tell you, God's people shine like the sun in the eternal city. One man said that, there's a passage in Revelation that said, the saints of God wear their righteousness. He said that as you see the garments of the saints of God, they're radiant like sun, or, or like light comes out of their garments. And it's, it's the most brilliant light. There's no, they don't have shadows like I do right here because there's no darkness in that place. It's just total light, total love, and total peace. But he says, as you get closer to the saints of God on the streets of glory, you see that on their garment, on every thread of their garment is written their works. And it's little things. Smiled at someone, said God bless you to a store clerk. It's the little things that we do for his glory that carry into eternity. And he says that when you look at the saints of God, their garments sing praises to God. Literally, physically, there's a noise that comes out of their garments and it tells you of their life in Christ. Isn't that amazing? I want more of that. John sees this. And he goes, and the man says, stop this. I'm just like you. <clears throat> This speaks to me on many levels. One, we've all heard of great men of God, great women of God. And we go, wow, what an anointing. What a blessing to be able to be like that. And I just hear this passage, stop this. I'm just like you. I, I love to study the life of, of people, the lives of people like Smith Wigglesworth, John Lake. Pastor Connie can tell you way more about him than I can. She's the church historian. I'm jealous of the knowledge. Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> Jelly, okay. And I look at the lives of these men and I see the miracles that they performed. I see the things that they did for God. I see the risks that they took, the way God showed up the way that things happen in their lives, it's just, it's just remarkable. It's just remarkable. And I hear the Lord saying, these are men just like you. Dry bones live. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. We've heard this a lot, especially in, in recent years in our Pentecostal and charismatic circles. We hear this, this expression that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When you testify of the works of Christ, you're prophesying, do it again, do it again, do it again. I wrestled with God on this. <clears throat> Galen, thank you for your word. Galen comes to me, he's the He's a prophet in my life. He came to me this morning and he said, I, I, I discern that you've been wrestling with this. The Lord says you're right on track. Carry on. You can't, you can't. You, it's hard to be anything but humble when there's people like that in your life. <clears throat> I'm just going to share some stories with you guys today. Just some things that I've seen God do in my life. This is why I've wrestled with this. The worst testimony of my life 
would be that you look at me and say, wow, what a great man. I got some neighbors here. They live in our building. Everybody wave at Michael and Darcy. They know that I'm as full of baloney as anybody in this room. They know that I'm just a man. And if you don't believe them, ask my wife. <laughs> I've seen amazing things. Here's where the activation comes from. I get this question all the time. How come we never see miracles anymore? How come we don't see miracles in America? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. One, we have good insurance. Two, if I go to a place like, uh, like Africa, I'll tell you a couple of Africa stories today. Does that sound fun? If I go to a place like Africa and I'm preaching in a church or doing ministry in a street, I may pray for two or three, four, five hundred people in one meeting. Are you with me? There is a much higher chance of a lot of miracles happening when I pray for a lot of people. This is not... Are you guys with me? Is this okay? Okay, I'm just going to share from my heart today. When I come home, and I may do 15 meetings like that in one trip. How many, do the math, how many people can that add up to? A few thousand, okay? I've done crusades where there's been thousands of people, and we've seen mass healings, all right? It's really a law of averages in that regard. Here's the clincher, though. Here's the real important part to understand why you don't hear about miracles in America. Because everybody expects something to happen on a mission trip. Nobody expects something to happen at the super center. That is true. We don't see the stuff that we see overseas or even in Mexico or places like that because we're not prepared mentally. We wake up and we're thinking about all the things we've got to accomplish. For that day, we're thinking about all the things, all the bills we've got to pay, all of the deadlines we have to meet. We're not thinking God's going to shine today through me. I, I, I'm going to try to keep saying that. <clears throat> if our expectation is status quo, then guess what happens? You guessed it. Good job. Are you with me? If I can get out of the comfort zone of the American dream, dry bones live. Dry bones live. Dry bones live. If I can get out of the comfort zone that I've been in, and I can get out of the place that I've been walking in for however many years, and I can look at each day as an opportunity to shine Christ Jesus, you won't be hearing that question for much longer. <clears throat> let, me, let me try this. I share, I share the gospel a lot with, with uh, young people like Dom here on campus, you know, at UNL, and I'm hoping that I can get to I didn't even realize there's like three colleges in this town. <laughs> We're just getting warmed up, right? And, and one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, strikes me about, about young people especially <clears throat> is there's this sort of, well, what makes Christianity any different than Islam? What makes Christianity any different than Buddhism? What makes Christianity any different from Krishna or atheism? Pick your poison. This, this is what makes Christianity different. There are many things. There are many theological things that I could say. There are many, we could talk about how Jesus is the only, the only one that, that rose from the grave. We can talk, we, we, we can use all of these theological expressions, and I do. And they're powerful. 
But it's the supernatural element of what happens in the life of a spirit-filled, sold-out, born-again, radical believer. That is what's different. Let me tell you a story. How many of you know who Reinhard Bonnke is? Okay, good, a few of you. So Reinhard Bonnke is a, is a powerful missionary evangelist. He works in Africa a lot. His ministry, they say, they claim, have seen over 73 million people come to Christ. That's something that really, boy, that, that cooks in my kitchen. You know what I'm saying? And Reinhardt was doing a crusade in Indonesia. I think it was Indonesia. This is how I heard the story. And he had sent a representative to speak with one of the officials, one of the ambassadors of the region that he was going to be in. It may have been Jakarta, something like that. <clears throat> and the man's a Muslim. Indonesia has, um, I think, 260 million Muslims in it. It's the highest concentration of Muslims in any one country on earth. Reinhardt says, why not go there? <clears throat> so he sends a representative to talk to uh, one of the ambassadors there in the state, and uh, they, they, they begin to have a, a conversation about, I think he maybe was a mayor or something like that. I, don't hold me to, to his title. <clears throat> and they begin to have a conversation. Then it turns into a little bit of a debate, and then it turns into a little bit of an argument. And then, so they're going back and forth. Can we do this crusade? Can we, they were going to rent a stadium. Can we rent the stadium? Can we do this? Can we do this? And they get into this big discussion. The man says, the man says, there's nothing about Christianity that these people want. I'm, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you how I heard it. <clears throat> Some of you guys may have heard this story, so please don't lambast me for misquoting this. And the Christian leans forward and he says, listen. When we do this crusade, people are going to come to this meeting and thousands upon thousands are going to be healed. Blinded eyes are going to be opened. Deaf ears are going to be opened. And we may even see dead bodies come back to life. And the Muslim ambassador, mayor, whatever he was, slams his fist on the table and he says, yes, and that's what you Christian boys have on us. It's the supernatural life of the spirit-filled believer that makes us different. I can argue, debate, I can have conversations with people, I can speak eloquently or I can sound like a hillbilly. Whatever the, whatever the situation may call for. And I may win a few and I may lose a few, but let me tell you something, when I put my hands on people and blinded eyes are opened, there's no questioning that. You guys with me? So I want to share five things, five areas of life where you can have supernatural increase. And the Apostle Paul confirms this. He says, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. In other words, I wasn't just really smart. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration, say demonstration, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. <clears throat> miracle type number one, instantaneous miracles. I'm sharing with you guys, this is what I grappled with. If I share with them, I don't want to feel like I'm boasting or like this is something that I've done and nobody else has done. I want to acknowledge right up front that there is an army of people like me that's going across the earth right now. There is an army of people who are, who are seeing stuff like this every day. Okay? I want to share a couple of stories with you. Number one, an instantaneous miracle story. Say instantaneous. How many of you know that all miracles don't happen immediately? Sometimes healing is progressive. The Bible says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. The ten lepers, Jesus prayed for them and he said, go and the Bible says, as they went, they were made whole. Sometimes it's a process. Can we agree on that? Okay. <clears throat> there are instantaneous miracles. I was in Ethiopia. 
a few years ago with a friend of mine. Not a real strong believer, this friend. He invited me to go there uh, as a gift to me for my birthday. He's an old friend, very successful man, and he said, I want to take you to, to Africa, and we're going to go to Ethiopia, and we're going to do a three-day trek in the Simeon Mountains. The Simeon Mountains are some of the most beautiful landscape you can possibly imagine. Unbelievably rugged, gorgeous, just, you know, uh, right at the top of the, of the African Rift Valley there. Gorgeous place. They had those, those big, hairy baboons. Like, long, long hair. They're, 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 they're crazy looking, and there's just mobs of them out there. Um, so we're out there hiking <clears throat> the first day. We started at 10,500 feet right in there. I was a little heavier then and not in the best of shape. I'll just, I'll just put that out there. I try to live my life transparent, so I'm just going to say I was struggling. Uh, we had a guide with us. Um, it was a Muslim guy, and he had a rifle. So as soon as we get there, they said, you have to hire a guide. It's the law. You have to hire a cook, and you have to have all the... This guy was called a scout. And so the guy walks out, and he's got his rifle, and I'm like, I may be preaching on this thing. Is this going to be okay? And I just felt like the Lord said, just relax. It's going to be good. So we're hiking. I mean, these guys are studs, man. They're way ahead of me. Um, if you've ever been at 10,000 feet, it ain't no joke. Okay? And we went up and down and up and down. So we would go from 10,000 to 12,000, you know, back to 11. And it was this kind of hiking and just, just unbelievably beautiful scenery. We hiked for five and a half hours at altitude. Okay? And we came to this little village. There's this little Muslim village, and, and I want to try to paint a picture to you, primitive as primitive can be. Uh, think Gilligan's Island. Okay? No power, no phone, no lights, no motor cars, not a single luxury. And we come into this village, and I think they said there were about 700 people that lived there. And completely, totally uh, Islamic culture. At this altitude, it's probably 55 50 to 55 degrees, it's cool, and I'm just uh, like this at five and a half hours. <clears throat> and we come into the village, and so they have a tradition there as you come into a village, they do what they call a coffee ceremony. They bring you into someone's house, and then uh, it was so good. It was so good. How many of you love coffee? Some people won't drink coffee. I think it's going to be served at the marriage supper of the lamb. And you go in and you sit down, and, they, and so they roast the beans right in front of you, and then they grind the beans, and they make you a cup of coffee. It's, it's so, so incredibly good. And as we're drinking the coffee, I hear the Lord speak to me, and I begin to feel him quicken me. Mind you, I'm exhausted. All I want to do is sit down and not get back up. And I heard the Lord say, ask for their sick. So I told my translator, <clears throat> I want to minister to these people. Can you ask these, there was a couple of ladies in there. Can you ask these ladies, are there any sick in this village? My friend looks at me. He goes, why are you asking that? I said, because you're about to see some miracles. He goes, I don't know about this, Bivens. I said, it's going to be all right, I promise. <clears throat> They talked, they speak a very strange dialect there called Amaric. And they were talking, going back and forth, and they were looking at me and pointing. And I'm trying to drink my coffee, and I'm trying to gather my breath. And really, all I really wanted to do was lie down. And they look to the translator, and they shake their head, and he says, yes. He tells me, yes, there's one man that's been very sick. I said, take me to him. And my friend goes, I don't know about this, Bivens. I don't know about this. So where do they go? Back down the mountain. <laughs> Nobody ever said serving God was easy. Back down the mountain. And all I'm thinking now is I got to come back up this thing. <laughs> and we get down the mountain and they take us to this little, they're, uh, they're, they're the mud huts, the round kind of huts with thatched roofs. <clears throat> very cool, very interesting, very beautiful people. And a lady steps out. My translator begins to talk with her. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm, my voice is stressed. And uh, I said, ask, is this his wife? He says, yes. And she says, uh, she tells him what's going on. Her husband has been bedfast for three years. 
His body is declining and declining and declining. Nobody knows what's wrong. And for six months, he's not been off the ground. And so I said, is it okay if I come in? I want to pray for him. And she says, yes. And so we come into the, come into the hut, and there he is. Every time I tell this story, i got to be careful because I, it, it just wrecks me. I see this man. He may have weighed 70 pounds. Shrunken on a pile of rocks. No power. And he just has a look of hopelessness. And I said, can I pray for him? I'm a Christian. I want to pray for him in the name of Jesus. Is that okay? The woman says, yes, it's okay. And I said, can he sit? And so two or three people came, sat him up on the, on the rocks. And I came and I sat next to him. And I spoke, I put my arm around him and I spoke to my translator, <clears throat> to this man. And I said, what is his name? He told me his name. I said, what does that mean? He said, his name means happiness. And I said, sir, when was the last time you were happy? And he just began to shake his head, and he said, I don't know. <clears throat> and I said, well, I'm going to pray for you today, and Jesus is going to heal you. Is that okay? I look out the door. There's a mob of people now trying to see what's going on. My friend is about 16 shades of purple. <laughs> back and forth. He goes out of the house. I don't see him. He comes back in. He's, I don't know about this. I don't know about this. Don't touch that man. I've got a lot of money. I'll pay for a doctor to come out here. I said, today we're going to see the glory of God. Faith is audacious. And I said, I'm going to pray for this man in the name of Jesus. Is that okay? And they all say yes. And so I put my hand on his chest. I don't pray long prayers when I pray for healing. <clears throat> and I said, in the name above all names, I command this spirit of infirmity to go, and I set you free. And I let go. And the man looked at me like a calf looking at a new gate. And then he turns his head, and he looks down. And I'll, I'll never forget this. And the look came over his face, and I told the translator, what's wrong with him? And he said, he says he feels heat. I said, that's Jesus. And I stood up. Now, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. There's 500 Muslims outside. And I got one lunatic friend that's looking for the fastest way out of town. <laughs> I'm all alone. It's me and Jesus. I love this. This is where God meets you. And I stood up and I put my hand out to this man. And I and he reached up, very reluctantly, he reached up and took my hand. I said, what do you feel, sir? And he said, I feel peace. And the Lord said, get him up. And I gave him a pull, and I took his other hand, and I pulled. And when I pulled this man, I heard and felt everything from here to here pop. And I thought... I have done it. I have jerked his arms out of socket. This is the end of Brian Bivens and probably my friend too. And you know when, you, when something dramatic happens, there's thoughts that just flood through your mind and there are 500, 500 thoughts of doubt that say you're bigger than all of them, knock them down and get down the mountain. This is it. You've done it. You're dead. You're finished. You've heard him. They're all going to see what a fraud you are. And at that moment, that long, I heard all of those voices come into my mind. But I heard one voice that said, I went to the cross for that man too. You get him on his feet. 
and I pulled anyway. And he stood up and he looked at me. And I let go of him and he began to walk. And he walked to the edge of that door, he walked to the edge of that hut, and he stuck his head out and he presented himself to a community of people that have probably never even heard the name of Jesus. And I walked out and said, look what Jesus has done to this man. Let me tell you something. At that moment, evangelism is easy. And God healed that man. And I've got a picture of him at home. Two weeks later, he walked 35 miles or something like that to the nearest town to get food for his family. Instantaneous miracle. Dry bones live. You guys in a hurry? Okay, that's one. I got a few more. I want to tell you about a progressive miracle. Another time I was in Kenya. I was doing a crusade way out in the bush. These people told me that they had never even seen white people. Way out in the bush uh, in Kenya, in western Kenya, that's where the Kenyan runners, you know, the guys that do the long distance, this is where they all come from and train, from what I hear. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous scenery, but not for the faint of heart. And our, we're, we're out there, and we're doing this crusade. There's a, there's a road, where, where, there's this place where three or four roads come together, and so there are all these little communities and villages that come. We had a generator, we fired the generator up, and I just began to preach the gospel. Saw lots of people healed, lots of people got saved. It was, it was glorious. We got them plugged into the pastor that was there in that region, and uh, God just really began to move. But on the way back to where I was staying, I slept in a barn that night with a bunch of chickens. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, on the way back, they said, there's this other woman. They want you to, to pray for her. We had to walk, I think, maybe a mile back to the, to the four-wheel drive that we were in. And then we were taking this really horrible road. It was like being in Oklahoma. We would take this really horrible road back to the place where we were sleeping. And they said, there's another woman up here. They want to know if you'll pray for her. And I said, yes, take me to her. It's just about, the sun's just about setting. It's twilight. And we stop. <clears throat> and there's a cornfield. And I, my first thought is, children of the corn. <laughs> my first thought is, this is it. They're going to hack me up. So we get out of the car, where do they go? Right through the corn. Praise him. And we hiked and hiked and hiked and got back here to this other little, this other little village again. Very primitive, no electricity, uh, no TVs, no cell phones. You know, there ain't no signal out there. And we go into this little place and it's, by now it's pretty dark. And we walk in and of course, imagine a six foot tall, 235 pound white man walking into the village where nobody's ever seen a white man at dark. It was a little awkward, right? So they all looked at me. And I said, is this the place? They said, yes. I said, take me to her. It was a woman. I had found out there was a woman that had cancer. And she had cancer in her abdomen. And they said, she's very sick. She's probably not going to make it. I said, yes, she will. It's going to be okay. So I went into the, to the house there. And at that moment, I rem you know how when God speaks to you sometimes, he, he reminds you of things. And I remembered the story of Jairus' daughter. And Jesus put everybody out of the house. And I said, I want only this woman's husband in the house. And the pastor and my brother that was with me, Pastor Moses. And the whole family went out. They said, okay. So they all went out. And they pull back a, 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 there was a blanket hanging, and they pull the blanket back, and, and there's this woman laying there on her deathbed. And I can smell, at this moment, I can, I don't want to be too gruesome, but I can smell the abscess. And so I said, they, these, are, these are Christian people. These are people that, that believed in Jesus, at least at some, at some level. And I said, I'm going to pray for you, sweetheart, and God is going to heal you today. And she looked up at me again with total hopelessness. <clears throat> and I pulled the blanket off of her and I laid my hands on her body and I said, in the name of Jesus, cancer, I command you to go. And I command these wounds and everything that is associated with this devil to be healed. 
And I turned around and I said, when was the last time she ate? And they said, it's been weeks. So I said, get her some food. Let's go. Jesus will be along directly. We walked out. I, I saw her get up off the bed, and then she said, I must lay down. I'm not feeling well, blah, blah, blah. Well, I found out we left, and I just, I just trusted God. I left it at that. I found out two weeks later, they, someone had come into town from that village, from that closest town, and had sent a message to my friend Moses and had told him that over the course of two weeks, that wound closed. And as that wound closed, she began to feel better and better, began to eat more and more. She was totally restored, started going back to church again. Progressive miracles. A lot of times we think that we have to see something happen. A lot of times we think that we have to see someone, you know, we have to see that thing close before we trust God. I believe the gospel is greater than what we see. I believe the word of God is greater than what we see. I believe just like when Jesus told those lepers, as you go, God will heal you, that, that sometimes that happens. And so we got to stand in our faith. A lot of times if we don't see something happen in church, we go, well, it must not have happened today. And immediately we omit and cancel what God's trying to do. Faith stands in the breach. Faith does not back down. It does not say it's over. It does not say it's finished. Faith takes the word of God and says... You said you were going to heal her. You said if I lay my hands on the sick, they will recover. These are your words. I'm doing this because of what you said. Regardless of what I see, this is how it will be in no other way because Jesus is king. Amen. Faith is audacious. Dry bones live. Let's talk about a financial miracle. My wife and I have lived by faith. How many years now? Five, six years we've been without a job, a, a real job. I've been doing ministry for a number of years now. I did ministry part-time for years and always had a job. Always, <clears throat> I was a general contractor. <clears throat> when God called us into ministry, he said, I want you to sell everything and give it. Or, or, I, don't, I don't remember if he said give it away. He may have, and I was disobedient. But He said, sell everything and wait on me. That's what we did. Several months later, after all our money was gone, we began to see things happen. We rented a house in this little community, and every month, it was tight. Every single month, we would get $20 here, $30 there. I went and preached, uh, I went and preached for, you know, like I heard Jesse Duplantis talk about preaching for a Dr. Pepper. Been there, done that. But I trusted God. I knew that God was going to, I knew that God was going to deliver us. I knew that he was going to make things happen. Over the course of two or three years, we continued to have that, just like at the last minute, something would show up, and our needs would get met. And so we had to stretch our faith again. And I went to a brother one time, a man that had been in ministry for a number of years, and I said, brother, I'm, this is wearing me out. I'm so used to making decent money. I'm so used to having everything we need, you know, not, not having to worry about budgets and finances. And he just looked at me, and he said, Brian, let me tell you something. The lack will test your commitment. But the abundance is the, the the blessing is going to test your character. And I said, "Okay, I can live with that." It was right around that time we began to see a shift. My heart began to change. Say heart. My heart began to change. And I began to see a shift. And for three years we lived right on the edge of being in the red all the time. And for the last two or three years, we've been in the black completely, fully, every year. Two, almost two years, well, almost three years ago, we began to pray, Lord, we want a home. We've been paying somebody else's mortgage. We believe you want us to have a home. And we began to pray and pray and pray, God, give us a home. God, give us a home. God, give us a home. Even had a prophetic word. God's going to give you a home. Somebody's just going to walk up to you and hand you a deed. <clears throat> so we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, and we were up and we were down, and we were up and we were down, and we were up and we were down. Finally, one day, a prophet friend of mine calls me, and he says, listen, and you have to know my friend, this is just how he talks. He goes, hey, listen, 
God says you're not being specific enough. Write down what you want. Goodbye. So I went, it, 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 bear, it bore witness with me, and I went and told my wife, this is what he said. And we spent, what, a day, day and a half, writing down things that we, we desired in a home. Now, I'm not, I, I'm not saying that this is how it will work for every one of you, okay? But what I'm saying is if you put your faith in God and you stand in faith, God answers prayer. And we were, we were uh, so we wrote everything down. I went somewhere. Where'd I go? I went to Africa again. And when I got back from Africa, like, the next day, my wife says, I found this house. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I don't want to look at another house ever again. She says, I found this house, this little farmhouse. It's right outside of town, about 12, 13 miles. Let's go take a look. I got jet lag. I'm beat down. It's November. Close to Thanksgiving, I want some bread for some turkey. I said, okay. So we get in the car the next day, we go and look. And as I get out of the car, I look at the property and I'm thinking, okay, there's some land here. One of the things we wanted was a little bit of land. And we start walking through the property. I see these little things that are alerting me that God may be trying to say something. I saw a guitar pick. I saw some bullets, some shotgun shells. I love to, I love to hunt. I saw golf balls. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, all right. No bowling balls. And we go in the house, and the house is just destroyed. Just, I mean, somebody had let dogs go in it, and it smelled really bad, and, and it, it had just been kind of trashed and not taken care of. And I looked at my wife, and I said, this is the house. This is it. This is what we put on our list. Every single thing to the smallest detail was there. I had to work. I had to remodel the house. I had to do a few things, right? But I said, this is it. And I looked at the realtor and I said, we're definitely interested. So we went home. We prayed for a few days. And was it Sunday or Saturday night or something like that? I said, we're going to make an offer on that house on Monday. My wife goes, with what? I said, I don't know. God's going to do something. This is what's on our list. Are we going to believe for it or not? We went back two or three times. Walked around. I walked way back in the pasture one day with a friend of mine. And he said, did you see that sign? There's a sign hanging in a tree, like a long blue sign. On one side it said Fort Snuff. And I just walked past it. I didn't think anything of it. My friend goes, Brian, did you see that sign? And I said, yeah, it's stupid. He goes, look at that sign. And I turned, and as I turned, the wind blew, and that sign turned like this. On the other side, it said, all you have to do is believe. <laughs> True story. True story. I went home, and I told Amanda, pack. We're buying that house. How? I don't know. We went to church the next day. We went home. We started boxing everything up. Monday morning, I got up, prayed. Did my thing, had my coffee, whatever, whatever. Got in the car, waited for the bank to open. I got a friend that's a banker. I was driving to the bank, I'm just going to see if there's anything, any kind of programs, anything possible. On the way to the bank, I get a phone call. It's a man that I had known just for a couple of months. But watch this, I had prayed for his wife and God healed her of scoliosis. What are you doing? And I had played golf with him. What are you doing? I said, I'm going to the bank. I'm going to see if there's any funds or any, any programs available for us. He goes, well, I talked to my wife, and uh, don't go to the bank. We're going to buy that house and donate it to your ministry. And I almost had a wreck. And of course, I'm like, what? He says, yeah, go to the realtor, tell her we'll pay full price. I said, okay. Let me call you back. I called my wife. She was in the shower. I said, hey, uh, guess what? And she's sticking her head out the shower talking to me. <clears throat> and I told her what had happened, and then there was like silence. All I could hear was the water running. I said, are you there? Hello? 
And then I just hear, <laughs> and the Lord touched her right there in the shower. We went back, we made a couple of offers. We, we had to play the little real estate game, but God provided everything he promised he would provide. God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to be blessed. I'm, 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 not saying, I'm, not, I'm not trying to stretch that into something that it's not, okay? But I began to read the scriptures, and the Word of God says that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children, but an evil man leaves nothing. And I began to cry out to God, and I began to say, Lord, you said I'm good. You said that I'm holy. You said that I'm righteous. It's on you to make sure that my kids have an inheritance. Because I had nothing. God answered. Dry bones, live. Dry bones, live. There is a realm of peace and prosperity that God wants us to walk in. I'm not saying we all are going to own yachts. I'm not saying that we're all going to have our own jet planes. But God does not want you to struggle and have nothing. Dry bones, live. There's a bunch of stories that I have here that I could share with you guys. I'm going to try to wrap it up. Let me just tell you about a strange miracle. How many of you want to hear a strange miracle? We live in Texas uh, most of the time. And where the particular part of Texas that we live in is what they call Tornado Alley. And so I had heard stories about people praying and seeing tornadoes and things like that. And, and uh, uh, all my life, I, uh, or at least a good, you know, a good portion of my life, I have lived in Texas, minus about 10 years when I lived out west. I had never seen a tornado. So when Amanda and I moved to this community, I, it just kind of bothered me. Lord, I've never seen a tornado. So my friend and I were driving to Wichita Falls one day, which is a city just north of where we live, and I, his name's Jackie, and I said, Jackie, I've never seen a tornado before. We were just talking, and he goes, oh, I've seen a whole bunch of them. I was like, well, well, that's not cool. And then he goes, look! And I looked out into a field, and a tornado came out of the sky at that moment. Like one of those, uh, uh, what do they call them? Uh, what did you call it? Something like that. It was one of those finger ones. It wasn't real big. It wasn't like, you know, a mile wide or anything. And I went, oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. Now I've seen one. We drove on. Well, from that day forward, tornadoes just began to show up all the time. <laughs> so one day, my wife and I were in the little house that we were renting at the time. And, of course, there's a certain season when there's a heightened, you know, you, you see these things a lot, right? And we had begun to have dreams, and we had begun to have these really radical kind of encounters with the presence of God. And my faith was just exploding at that time. And one day, the storm hit our city, and the siren went off. And when that siren goes off, it'll make you think you missed a rapture. It's loud. And the siren goes off, and we don't have a cellar. And it's just, I don't remember if it was hailing or not. I know that it was, it was seems like it was raining. And I walked to the back door, we had some French doors, and I looked, and there was a tornado right over my city, coming right at us. And something happened inside of me. I, I can't explain what happened, but it felt like something broke. You remember those, you know those glow sticks they give you? you? Break that thing, and the light comes on. It was like there was a glow stick inside of me that got broke, and the light came on. And I threw that back door open. And I walked out and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, you will not touch this city and you will not touch my house or anything that is mine. And I watched. Within five seconds, that thing just went. Amen. Coincidence? I think not. Because it happened again a few months later. The same scenario, we saw another tornado and I walked out and I said, you will not come near this house, you will not come near this family, you will not come near this city. And it disappeared 
three hours later, it hit Moore, Oklahoma. God wants you activated. You have dominion. You have authority. You have the life of Christ. We are not weak people. We are not society's outcasts. We are the rightful heirs of salvation. Dry bones, live, live, live. I could tell you other stories, appliances we've prayed for that came back to life, cars that supernaturally made it all the way across the United States and then broke as soon as we got home. Angels. How many of you have seen angels? A few of you. Angels are real. I got three of them with me at all times. And then when I go to work, there's others that show up. We've seen them with our physical eyes. One night we were coming into our hometown. It was dark. We're driving up a hill. There's a, there's a crest of a hill that you go over just before you come into our city in Texas. And a a shining light appeared in the middle of the road, shining blue light, ran across the highway right in front of me, and I swerved off the road and slowed down. As soon as I swerved, there was a car coming over the hill in the other direction that we didn't see in my lane. Angels exist. They're here to serve. They're here to support what God's doing in your life. Dry bones come alive dry bones come alive. My wife and I looked at each other. Did you see that? She said, yes. What was that? I said, I think it was an angel. We looked at the kids and they were like in another world. They didn't see nothing. But we both saw it. Church, there's an element of supernatural life that we are all to expect. And I want to say today that if you're not seeing the supernatural in your life, today's the day to get activated. What does impartation mean? I'm getting the music here, so I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. What is an impartation? We believe in this church that the cross is finished, that everything that you need is in Christ Jesus, and that you don't have to wait for some man to give you something. So when we use the expression impartation, that word in the Greek actually means to share. So when I share these stories with you, what I'm doing is prophesying of Jesus to activate what's happening in your life. Because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And as I share these stories with you, believe that they're for you, and they are. If you think this guy's crazy, he needs to go back to Texas, he ate too much chicken fried steak, whatever it is that you're thinking, that's fine. I still love you, I'll still see you in heaven. You just may not have the supernatural activated. It's really simple. If you don't believe that God heals, guess what? In your life, He doesn't. If you don't believe that God does strange miracles, then that's okay. But in your life, He won't. Because in the kingdom, everything is activated by what we believe. Is that true? Did I make that up? Believe it? And receive it. I'm just a man, just like all of you. There's nothing special about me except what's in me. Because what's in me changes the whole atmosphere, it changes the whole thing. Like Pastor Connie says, we, we're a new species. When we come into a room of darkness, we're shining light. Do you believe that? Then it's time to receive. Stand up. I'm going to keep this simple and then I'm just going to dismiss, okay? If you need prayer for healing, I don't know how many healing miracles we had this week. We had a bunch of them. If you need prayer for healing, I want you to come forward. But more importantly, if you want to get activated, if you want to receive from God this supernatural existence, I'm going to lay hands on you and I'm going to pray that God will give you boldness 
and that he'll establish your identity. That simple. And if you believe it, it'll happen. Amen? Father, I thank you for this service. I thank you for these people. Lord, I thank you for the word of God, which is truth. I thank you for the radical, radical encounters that you're willing to give to your people, not because they deserve them, but because you're so good. You're just so good. And Lord, I thank you for activating people today. Holy Spirit, come. If you don't do this, I'm finished. This is all you, Lord. This is all your heart. This is what you asked for. So I thank you right now for manifesting your presence in this place. I thank you right now for activating people, whether they feel something today or not, that they walk out of here knowing that there's something new, there's something radical, and that they begin to express the supernatural existence of Christ that is in them into the economy and the society and the culture that they're in outside of this building. Lord, I'm speaking today. Dry bones, live. Dry bones, live. Wind of the Spirit, fill this house. And Lord, as they go, let them go with grace, let them go with peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord God Almighty lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. If God's speaking to you and you want to get activated today, come forward. The rest of you, God bless you. We love you and there's nothing you can do about that.